Welcome to episode 188 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Andrew Swafford. And Lydia Creech. And, and in today's episode, we will be talking about movies we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we will be continuing our Tennessee Auteur series with a double feature. We're going to be looking at 1957's Jailhouse Rock and 1980's 9 to 5. Looking at two Tennessee icons, Elvis Presley and Dolly Parton. Um, but first, uh, some quick notes. Uh, it's been a while, actually, since technically, really, we've recorded. The last episode, we've recorded, uh, you know, a little bit in advance. Um, so we, I want to point to a few things uh some new stuff on the site lydia has reviews up of a wrinkle in time and tomb raider uh and by the time this episode comes out there will be a second review of wrinkle in time by yes. courtney anderson which will be a very different take yes she has an alternate take Probably on that take. <laughs> Um, And then also very exciting, Andrew was on the local news in Knoxville, Tennessee, WVLT, and we have that video linked up on the website if you did not watch that, you know. I feel like hopefully some people are, are tuning into this episode, uh, you know, or tuned in the last week's episode, you know, for the first time. That that was, an, no offense, but that was a, a very deep episode to, like, jump in on if that was their first time. <laughs> it was like an hour and a half, and it was a lot. So... Yeah, well, welcome Knoxvillians. Uh, one week late, I guess. I would also like to give a little bit of behind the scenes about that news uh, piece because I ha- Zach knows this. He watched it live. I had to follow teenagers who made a robot and then a clip of O.J. Simpson uh, that was resurfaced from the 90s. Uh, and then like... Some some youths from from the University of Tennessee have started a podcast about films. <laughs> yeah, so, it was, yeah, I was, it was like, um, it was not a good, it was not a good, uh, you know, like like the robot and the OJ admit, admitting to murder pretty much was was like up there, like <laughs> oh Jesus, yeah. Um, all right, well let's go ahead and jump into movies that we saw this week. Uh, this one, I guess, is a a continuation of my strange movies that I watched in Savannah. This is another psychotronic film society showing here in, in Savannah, Georgia. This one was 1974's chosen survivors. Um, and much like I did with robo vampire, I'm just going to try to break this movie down for everybody. So, so chosen survivors, it opens up and this group of random people are assimilated into this, uh, you know, into this this bunker, this 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 you know high tech bunker, and are told that the nuclear holocaust is here. You know, everything's blown up, and they're tasked with keeping the human race alive and so they're going to stay in this bunker until the you know whatever alerts them that the radiation on the surface is okay and then they can go back onto onto earth and so while they're having to process this because you know like the opening shots are are of them kind of looking very drugged and and taken off of a helicopter and then it's super strange because there's this long line of soldiers and they're like kind of pushing the people and so it's like the you know they're, they're just getting pushed along this long line of of you know green camo clad men and then pushed into an elevator so they're they're a little disoriented so they're dealing with all all of this information being processed um and there's not really too many big name actors in, in this um uh i believe diana Mulder, who is in it was is in a number of Star Trek TV shows. Uh, the biggest name probably is Jackie Cooper, who is one of the very first uh, child stars. Uh, in this, though, he is he's grown up and is kind of crotchety and an asshole. So not as cute as he was in The Little Rascals, sadly. Um, but anyway, so so they so they're in this bunker. They're trying to kind of you know come to grips with what's happening, and you know. Gosh darn it! These vampire bats get in and start terrorizing them, and it, it you know I hate when I'm in my nuclear holocaust bunker and vampire bats get in and start picking off different members of the of the group. So after one death by just complete mutilation by vampire bats, um, one of the people in the in the bunker reveals actually I'm a scientist working with the government and this was all kind of just a test to see how people would react if they were put in this type of situation so 
you know, this the the world is not ended. You're not the the last survivors, and uh, this is this isn't good now because this person has died wait, 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 because wait. of these vampire bats. <laughs> So at what point in the running time in the movie is it revealed that there was not an actual apocalypse? Probably like a like an Spoilers. hour 20 and it's an hour and 40 minute movie. <laughs> okay. Oh <my> okay. God. <laughs> this is very early in the review of the movie. Yeah. But I mean, but nothing really happens up to that point. It just it's kind of I mean, think like Alien, like the first Alien movie where they're just kind of doing random stuff and kind of just like there's a lot of that where they're just kind of hanging around and and engaging with each other and in in a lot of that t- type of dialogue and, and conversation. Um so there's a lot of that That's and then yeah, this happens and huh okay um and and so he's like all right well i'm gonna send a signal and we're gonna get out of here and it it, will just all forget that this happened and of course the signal does not properly go up and of course the vampire bats find a much easier access point to get into this bunker so then they come up with this idea. One of the people in there is like this former Olympic athlete who's kind of looking to get that gold, you know, gold, gold stature once again. So he decides I'm going to climb up the thousand, fifteen hundred plus foot elevator shaft. I'm going to climb up that. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to go get help. And then we're going to get out of here. Naturally, he does get to the door vampire bats swarm him he falls 1500 feet into the elevator the vampire bats follow him massacre numbers of people and then i have a question i have many questions but i have have another question are these the kind of vampire bats that you see in movies that actually turn into vampires or are they strictly bats the whole time no they're just bats i mean it's just like (laughs) they're just bats and they're hungry because they're stuck in the because they created this bunker in their cave and so they're kind of pissed because they're like we're hungry we want to do bat shit but we can't because you made a bunker in here so they kill all these people and then the the movie ends with the government coming in putting the bodies to the side, leading the others out. And then the, it's like the super sad, uh, m- like somewhat macabrely funny elevator ride up to the, and then it just ends and it's it, with just the survivors. And then I don't know, it, it was a strange movie, but at the same time, like the premise was kind of interesting. I don't know where the vampire bat thing kind of came into play. I think you could have like, made it more some like psychological you know just something but instead and, and they kind of were hinting at that because the jackie cooper character starts to kind of come up come unhinged a little uh, hinged a little bit but it's not like interesting unhinged it's like he's just a re- he's just a kind of bigoted drunk asshole so yeah that's chosen survivors you know if you do- I have to say though I, based on your summary i am only in it for the vampire bats I mean, psychological stuff, sure, that sounds like it could be a good movie, but I want to watch some vampire bats, so it's I pretty, think they made the right call. It's pretty crazy. It's it, it's like, like, and it's not just like one or two, like, uh, just a flood of vampire bats comes in and just takes out these people, and it's just... How do they do the effects? Are they real bats? <laughs> the effects are awful. It's it's it's, it's, okay. it's absolutely They're terrible. They're digital bats. Yeah, it's, it's just awful. But, I don't know. It's it. It was fun. It was. It, it's. It's. It, I'm gonna put it in the same category as I did with Robo Vampire. Get some friends over. Get some drinks in ya. Watch Chosen Survivors. That's all I can say. Yeah, it's a good party movie. Um. All right. The uh, the next movie that uh, I guess we we're gonna talk about is the Breadwinner. Um, it came out last year. It is directed by uh, Nora Twami, and it comes from Cartoon Saloon, which is the Irish uh, animation company behind Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea. If you've seen those two movies, uh, this one is is very different um, in terms of of content. It's it it kind of leaves the uh, the Irish mythology fairy tale world for a very uh, very real world uh, issues in in Afghanistan and these the story is about this young girl who whose father is taken away by the Taliban um, 
and she, she and her mother and her sister and her brother are left to try to figure out a way to provide for themselves, but they are unable to to provide for themselves, uh, you know, because they are women in Afghanistan at this po- point in time and are unable to purchase any items or, or do anything without the accompaniment of a man. And so in order to thwart that system, the the main character cuts her hair and poses as a boy to to provide for her family and and gets, you know, odd jobs and uh, gains a friendship along the way. Um, But, yeah, it's it's kind of it's one of those movies, I feel like, um, that goes under that category of it didn't necessarily need to be animated, but there's something really nice about the reason about the, the choice to make this an animated feature. Um, Andrew and Lydia, I know that you both have seen this movie. What, what did you make of the breadwinner? Yeah, it's my least favorite. I think that's come out of the studio and I don't know if it's because they stepped away. I, it felt like the least stylized, if that makes sense. Because uh, Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea have this like really interesting perspective that they do. Like everything is kind of flattened out or seen from above. It I don't know how to describe it unless you've seen them. <laughs> and it the breadwinner just felt like I don't know just another animated movie. And that sounds so terrible because I generally try like I like animation and that's. But, but it wasn't the same as the other ones. And I'm also not so sure that their the story that they were telling was like structured the best way. Uh, the main character is at the same time dealing like with her quote unquote real world problems with her father being gone and family is also like telling telling this story. And I, th- I that did not work for me. I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm with you on the style being sort of absent in this movie compared to Song of the Sea and Secret of Kells. Cartoon Saloon, um, in general, seems to be okay with having a flatness to their movies. I mean, this is one of the only animation studios consistently like just making two-dimensional animation at this point rather than CGI stuff like Pixar and Illumination and all that. Um, But in... Kells and Song of the Sea, there is a certain richness to the textures um, of the animation on those movies, even though the character design, like really the big bold lines on everything doesn't seem that far off from what you might see on a Cartoon Network show or something. Um, There's just a real intricacy to um, the the ornamentation of those movies uh, that I, I've never seen written uh, about, I've never seen anybody write about this anywhere, but it has always reminded me of this idea of sacred geometry, uh, the, the kinds of design that you see in like big cathedrals and mosques and things like that, uh, where you have all of these, uh, these beautiful, uh, Ge- geometrical shapes that are all like interlocking with one another that are kind of meant to evoke this sense of like this perfectly ordered universe that put in place by God. Um, and there's like a lot of Catholicism in those first two movies. So hearing that this was going to be a movie about uh, Islam, I was kind of hoping for more of that uh, because like mosques are so beautifully decorated inside. Um, but it does not go that direction and it feels a little bit more um stiff and a little bit more uh, bland in the colors. Um, But I do really admire this movie's boldness. Uh, I remember in the first couple years doing the podcast, we talked a lot about Pixar and Ghibli much more often than we do now, even though I still love both those companies. Uh, And I would make the point that the big difference between Pixar and Ghibli is that Pixar is never going to make a Grave of the Fireflies. Um, And Cartoon Saloon has proven that they are 100% willing to make their Grave of the Fireflies. Like This is a really uncompromisingly brutal movie. Um, At first, it seems like it is going... I mean... From from the opening scenes, it is uh, very upsetting. Uh, but once you get into that conceit of like, oh, she's dressing like a boy and doing a lot of sneaking around, you think it might be some kind of caper. Um, and it 100% does not become that. And it just becomes very harrowing uh, and, and uh, just punishing uh, in a way that just like leaves you with a pit in your stomach. Um, and I 
you know, I can't think of another stu- another animation studio working today now that Ghibli is gone that is doing anything even remotely to like the level of emotional uh, uh, just <laughs> travesty that this movie takes you on. Um, but I do want to circle back to a point you made, Lydia, about the story within a story. Um, th- you kind of get it in piecemeal, sort of like an Arabian Nights thing throughout the the film. And that is where they try and um, delve into some more um, like ornate animation style. And it's nice to look at, but honestly, the actual story being told in that, you know, meta fiction is not interesting. Uh, it, it mirrors what's going on in the outer layer of the story way too closely to be interesting. It's very predictable. It's kind of boring. Um, and it does have a cool payoff at the very end, but ultimately I think it takes up way too much of this movie's runtime uh, and doesn't have that sense of like visual wonder um, that you get consistently in Song of the, uh, Song of the Sea and the Secret of Kells. I I guess I'm much more um, forgiving with with the the story within the story conceit. Uh, I I don't disagree that it is kind of it is a very simple uninteresting tale, but I I was really moved with how. Um, you mentioned before that that the secret of Kells and Song of the Sea are very much steeped in this in this this religious this religious myth as well as um, just kind of just deeper Irish mythology, uh, and that's really just kind of woven into the tapestry of, of that film. Uh, I think I guess the best way to describe it, Lydia, like you were saying, it. I mean, it's it's almost like looking at illuminated manuscripts that have come to life and are are animated for you um and this one this one does kind of forego that uh, other than in the story and to me yeah it, it i guess it is a little disappointing that they didn't really try to try to weave um the islamic faith into into the story as much as they did with catholicism in the in the previous two films but i think that they supplemented that with just um the the cliche, I guess, if you want to call it, of of just storytelling in a in a in a broader sense, and the the comfort and the escape and the 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 you know the way you can hide within story within stories and, and storytelling. I think that the the whole conceit is there because uh, this the character over the course of the film is is really is is unable to. She, she, she's just kind of left vulnerable to the world and to the actions of the world. And she at least gives herself some protection, you know, through, through this myth that she's created. And at, at the kind of, you know, penultimate, you know, finale of this film, you can, you can kind of see her trying to, you can see her brushing up from, you know, between the, 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 the the way that she's created crafted the story around to, to to build a defense against the the real world real actions that are happening outside um and i don't know i guess the, i i just kind of found that moving in terms of the uh, of the of the, the the struggles of the different characters of their of their story trajectory i think that it's a very cliche um way to to tell a story but i think that we haven't necessarily seen it told um for characters like this and uh again i want to go back to the point that i made at the beginning it's a movie that i think that it's it's it is enriched by the by animation because it allows for uh kind of even though you have those darker moments like grave of the fireflies it, it allows for those fantastical beautiful moments um where it just kind of it kind of just opens up and and reminds you you know that this is an animated movie so i think that maybe it, i guess it just worked more for me than it did for you all it also allows for a little bit of distance from the subject matter, uh, which I think would maybe be a little too hard to take um, for some audiences without the the remove of animation. And I do think that people should see this movie. Um, I think that it could potentially be a very instructive one, especially if you are uh, going to share it with your kids. They should probably be 
maybe a little older of kids. Uh, this isn't quite for the illumination crowd. Um, but I, I, man, I find the, one of the opening scenes really, uh, illustrative. Um, and I might use it for a class if I ever end up teaching world lit again. Uh, and it's when, um, a member of the, gosh, I forget what the government in Afghanistan calls itself, but a member of the, the police raids um, this family's household. They take a bunch of their books, uh, just kind of ransack the place. And the, the lesson that, that American audience needs to learn from that scene is that every one of these characters identify as Muslim. Right. You can't say that the Muslim character is the is the uh, the theocratic uh, violent one who's raiding this household. And you can't say that um, the family uh, is you know, the true Muslims. And this guy is is, you know, so, some other like representative of the authoritarian state. They both claim to be Muslim. Right. And so I think that gets lost a lot in modern dialogues about Islam that tend to be very reductive um, and get into a lot of like no true Scotsman fallacies. Um, and we as a country are just like very bad at talking about like who the actual victims of uh, like terrorist violence um, is. And I think this movie illustrates that uh, beautifully. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, if you're interested in checking out The Breadwinner, which I, I hope you do, uh, it is on Netflix for your viewing pleasure there. Uh, Another film, it looks like it was also released last year. Uh, Lydia, you caught, was it Lydia and Andrew caught this uh, before we vanish? I think it came out last year, some places, but Uh, I I, doubt very many cities. Yeah. Very, very few cities probably saw this in 2017. Um, uh, Lydia, do you want to introduce it? Yeah, I saw it uh, last week. It's a new film from Kiyoshi Kurosawa, who uh, is a big J-horror director. He did Pulse and Cure? Cure? I'm not... I think it's just Cure. Um, He also did a movie last year or the year before called Creepy that was big in the art house circuit. Um. And I noticed that all of you guys gave it like one or two stars, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's about these, like it starts off kind of creepy. Uh, and it's like this girl has gone home and then we find out she killed her whole family and she's walking down the highway all bloody. And it's like, oh, I guess this is going to be kind of a gross horror film great but then it's just about these aliens uh turns out the girl is an is an alien and she's got some friends and they are scouts for the invasion and so they're there to like learn about people (laughs) i don't know it's a very old school alien invasion movie along the lines of an invasion of the body snatchers or something like that where um and I actually haven't seen Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about it. But um, the, the, you don't see aliens in this movie uh, in the same way that you see aliens in, like, Arrival or Annihilation, for example. Uh, they're all... Yeah, they're just vessel. They have taken humans as vessels, um, and the only way that you know they're aliens is that they don't necessarily know human idioms or the conventions of human life or anything like that. Uh, and the central conceit of the movie is that they are there to steal human concepts from human minds. Like you need to understand how uh, the the life on earth works uh, and therefore they're not like learning words in the same way that the aliens in arrival are learning words they're they're learning concepts like they they learn the concept of work uh, and the concept of property of the concept yeah. of love i'm forgetting some of the others but the way that the mechanic in the movie works is that when the alien learns the concept uh the human that they learned it from loses it uh, so there's an early scene um where this uh character's relative comes over and an alien is in the house and he takes the concept of family from her and so she has no conception of of connection to the people she she's in this house with and she just kind of like uncaringly walks out right and that that's where the drama of the movie is is like seeing humans lose these uh, ideas 
Uh, and there is a scene at the very end um, where a very key concept is stolen and really like made my heart sink. Uh, I, I mean, I, I had been... <laughs> I had been mostly bored throughout the movie uh, because it's way, way too long. It's like yeah, it's like well s- over two hours. Um, that seems like maybe a Kurosawa problem. I don't know. Pulse is see, how long slightly is too long. Curse, uh, or sorry, uh, Pulse is 118 minutes, so just under two hours. Cure is over two hours, I think. No, it's 111. Uh, so he he's around that two hour mark, um, and Pulse and Cure are like almost uh, slow cinema horror. And I heard that thrown around with creepy a whole lot. Uh, Pulse specifically, um, I admire for being a horror movie that gets scares from silence rather than from uh, big bursts of volume like you tend to get in American jump scare horror. Um, and it really will linger on a shot and just, it does that deal with it horror thing of making you stay in a room with a very foreboding uh, object uh, or, or um, entity. And you just have to deal with the emotions that you feel uh, being stuck with that thing. And Before We Vanish is not really a horror movie. You know, it starts horror, like you said, Lydia, but then it very quickly moves into more sci-fi territory. Um, And because everything, the the scope is so broad um, and the visual palette that it's using to uh, present that is so limited, you know, you're only seeing like actual humans. The way they steal concepts is just like touching somebody's forehead. So there's just like not a lot of visual spectacle happening here, uh, which... Which is also a kind of a thing in Cure. Uh, that's about a, a serial killer who hypnotizes people just by flicking a lighter on. But the difference is that when the lighter gets flicked on in Cure, uh, you freak out. And like it's, it's a very scary moment. Uh, and most of the time, I didn't really feel anything as the aliens are kind of moving around the world before we vanish. It, with the exception... I will again repeat of the climactic moment, uh, which really did work for me. Um, But most of this movie is very meandering and doesn't give you, it kind of gives you the same plot beat over and over. Like, oh, now they're stealing this thing. Now they're stealing this thing. Now they're stealing. And like, there's not a lot of forward momentum to this thing. And because it is so long and gives you so little to kind of relish visually, um, I was tracking with it for maybe an hour and then I just, there was a point where I just straight up didn't care anymore. Um, and it <laughs> continued going on for another hour. And so I, this was a two star movie for me because it, it definitely tried my patience in a way that I did not find rewarding. Yeah. I, when I was saying it's slightly too long, maybe it, maybe it's like an hour too long. <laughs> I I I saw the ending coming and it's like, okay, they they set it up over and over and over again, like all these concepts. And I was like, oh, I see. And then that's exactly how it ended. Uh (laughs) Also, it's one of those cliche. um, It's one of the it's a movie with one of these cliche like meme messages of like the real the real uh, aliens were the friends we made along the way or something like that. Um, Yeah. Like the real invasion was love uh is is kind of what this movie ends up uh saying which is just funny to think about in retrospect um and at times moving while you're watching it and other times just tedious i don't know kurosawa i mean i've only seen pulse otherwise but this one had a lot of it too just like a lot of guns and i'm like i don't know that this yeah like happens I think- in japan it turns into like a Bayhem thing at the very end. It does. And I was like, I didn't, it feels very Hollywood influenced, but for why? Why are you doing this? It's like Michael Bay meets North by Northwest's airplane scene for like 10 yeah. minutes at the end <laughs> oh of this God, movie. Yes. Uh, but, and that, that almost sounds like I'm giving it too much credit. Like the movie becomes very exciting and it kind of doesn't. Um, no, by the time you get there, you're very tired. <laughs> right. It's it's an exhausting uh, finale, I would say. Though, man, I really like Kurosawa from what I've seen of him. I've seen three of his movies. This, Cure, and Pulse. Um, and I... 
as much as this movie does not work for me, those two movies are doing something very special and very unique, and so I can't not recommend his stuff. Um, I think Cure might be his most perfect movie, um, but Pulse, I think, is the more innovative, revolutionary one. Um, People definitely need to go watch those if they're interested in horror, Japanese cinema, slow cinema. Uh, you can find Cure on Filmstruck. Um, there's a really nice new Blu-ray of Pulse from Arrow, which is available in the U.S., as not a lot of their stuff is. Um, so check those movies out, um, even if Before We Vanish doesn't really sound to your liking. But maybe it is. Maybe this is your kind of movie. Um, definitely weird. Maybe it'll work for some people. Uh, it left Maybe. here after a week. Yeah. <laughs> so who knows? Check check your local theater. Try to catch before we vanish. Before it vanishes. Before it, before it, yeah, 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 okay. Nice. Yep, um, nope. Well done. We just have a few minutes left, so I'll be very quick with this movie. I just wanted to give it a shout out because I it's been one I've been thinking about the last few weeks. Um, it came out last year. It's called Lucky. Uh, it's the directorial debut of John Carroll Lynch, who you've probably seen in a lot of movies. Uh, uh, character actor. Uh, I Most notably, I think of him for, as the husband in Fargo and the, uh, the people person everybody assumes is the Zodiac killer in the movie Zodiac. Um, <laughs> uh, this film, though, is also the last uh, is the, the last film work of the actor Harry Dean Stanton, who passed away last year. And Lucky is about... Uh, Stanton's character is a, is a 90-year-old atheist who is just living in this, you know, random wherever town in, in Texas. And... The, the kind of pace and the story of this movie reminds me of a film I liked uh, I really li- I liked a lot a couple years ago uh, Patterson by Jim Jarmusch where it's kind of about just the the beats of a of somebody's life uh, in, in this one you know lucky has a as a normal routine he wakes up he does some stretches he drinks some coffee he walks to the diner he gets more coffee and chats with the people at the diner he goes home and watches his his soap operas he goes uh, he takes a nap he then he wakes up he he eats and then he goes to the bar and chats with the people at the bar uh, one of the bar, patrons includes uh david lynch who plays uh one of the people in town named howard who also gives us i guess one of the the very small plot points in this film which is howard has lost his 200 year old tortoise named professor or uh President Roosevelt, and so he's looking for President Roosevelt, and everybody <laughs> around town's looking for President Roosevelt. And Howard is. I have to ask um, about before you move on from this plot point. As you are a person who has not watched David Lynch films or seen David Lynch's acting work in Twin Peaks, so like, what was your level, if any, of giddiness? watching David Lynch on screen because I would be at 11. <laughs> he's, he's very he's super charming because I mean I've seen him in stuff before it, it, it's I haven't watched his films or watched Twin Peaks but I've seen him it, it, it it's kind of uh <laughs> I guess my frame of my my most key frame of reference is his stint in uh Louis where he oh, plays yeah. the guy yeah. where he plays the guy teaching Louis how to uh be a talk show host. He's kind of like that where he's not he's not overly warm and nice, but he's not overly mean. He's just kind of just this this weird uh undescribable presence that's just there and kind of does his thing it, it's kind of nice he just shows up and does that for you know a total of 20 minutes in this hour and a half long movie uh it's 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 kind of fun but i don't it, it it's a it's a very moving film i it, you know it's it of course you have a lot of the qualifiers that harry dean stanton passed away last year and it kind of feels like one of those movies where you can just feel the you know it, it feels like that that kind of last you know great role or whatever you would like to say um but it also just has these really these really moving quiet moments where uh, you just are are kind of watching him interact with the world as best as he can, and he and he's and he's someone who has definitely defined how he sees and, and is going to to engage with the world at this point in his life. Um, 
and halfway through the movie it becomes kind of it kind of the, the facade of that kind of cracks somewhat and he's he's opened up to a vulnerability that he it seems like he's really never had to uh come in come to terms with and there's this really really incredible uh shot that lynch does where lucky is is lying in the bed and there's no music playing there's it's just natural sounds you hear crickets um and it's just him kind of semi curled up in the bed he's just kind of lying there motionless uh with a kind of not a not a sad look not a just kind of a despondent you know mind drifting look and it's just it's really sad and it's really uh but it's also very, like just kind of powerful and it's it, it's not, the setup in the in the composition is is just so simple um and i think that that's Seems like where, this movie is scratching your ozu itch a little bit Zach. It, it does it scratches my ozu itch a little bit but i i i, I it's it's a, it's one of those movies of simplicity that's that's very that's it, really nice and i i think that Henry, harry dean stanton does this really uh is this is this very charming curmudgeon um i would recommend lucky it's it's streaming on hulu now if you'd like to check it out uh lydia though you you saw this movie also do you have anything you'd like to add um i wonder if a lot of that like finding the quieter moments very touching or like his character having to come up pretty hard against his own morality is also kind of like an extra textual response because it is like like it was billed as Harry Dean Stan's last film. Um and so and I didn't quite connect with it as much as I think you did, Zach. I maybe I'm just a curmudgeon, but I like I associate Harry Dean Stan with his like character actor work and just, he's Brett and uh but I think from Repo Man and so like those are much more like smaller roles and not necessarily Paris, Texas or whatever, like where he's Zen or, (laughs) um, but it's fine. I like the David Lynch performances. I feel like David Lynch has one note and it's great. So (laughs) it's a great note. It's a great Uh, one. All right. (laughs) It's worth, it's worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, We're going to take a short break. We will be back talking Jailhouse Rock and 9 to 5 after this. Hello, Cinematary listeners. This is Zach Dennis with an important message because I have not talked to you enough during this episode. Uh, Cinematary would like you to know that we do not want your money. We're not clamoring for your dollars. At this time, we just want to enjoy each other's company and talk about the movies and feel our, you know, distribute our thoughts to the world and become podcasting moguls. You know, simple stuff. No money involved. Uh, However, there are a few things that you could do to help out the show. We would really appreciate it. The first thing is review us on iTunes. I know literally every podcast asks you this they're like please review us on itunes but it's like important because i don't know itunes this is what they do this is how this is how the apple lords constrict us and keep us in their system that's just what happens so we need a a nice little review just take like two minutes one day be like this is podcast review time put us on the list uh secondly you can tweet us we're at cinematary on twitter or better yet send us an email we're cinematary at yahoo.com so we can hear from you if you're just like zach uh you you have terrible taste. Why do you keep talking about these superhero movies? Uh, you keep talking. Also, you keep talking about these Japanese movies where all they do is, is is drink sake and smoke cigarettes and talk about how life's awful. And I'll be like, yeah, what you're wrong. And you'll be like, yeah, but I'm just emailing you. And it'll be a whole thing. It'll be a nice discourse. Think about it. Um, and finally, please tell your friends and family, you know, they should know as well. I'm sure they like movies. I'm sure they like podcasts. We don't know. Uh, to recap, review on iTunes. iTunes review day. Do that. Secondly, send your thoughts, Twitter, email, one of those. Do it. Third, share with your friends and family. We would love it. Do it, please. Thank you. Now, let's get back to the show.
stumble to the kitchen Pour myself a cup of ambition And yawn and stretch and try to come to life Jump in the shower and the blood starts pumping Out on the streets the traffic starts jumping With folks like me on the job from nine to five episode 188 of Cinematary. In this part, we'll be continuing our Tennessee Auteur series with 1957's Jailhouse Rock and 1980's 9 to 5. Uh, but first, we'll talk about Jailhouse Rock. It is directed by Richard Thorpe from a script by Guy Trosper. The film stars Elvis Presley, Judy Tyler, Mickey Shaughnessy, Vaughn Taylor, and Jennifer Holden. Uh, the film was about a young man sentenced to prison for manslaughter who is mentored in music by his prison cellmate who realizes his musical abilities. After his released from jail after a year mind you while looking for a job as a club singer the young man meets a musical promoter who helps him launch his career as he develops his musical abilities and becomes a star his self-centered personality begins to affect his relationships Uh, the wife of producer pandro s berman convinced him to create a film with presley in the lead role berman hired richard thorpe who was known for shooting productions quickly he lived up to that production began on may 13th of 1957 and ended on June 17th. Before pre-production began, songwriters Mike Stoller and Jerry Lieber were commissioned to integrate the film's soundtrack. In April, Lieber and Stoller were called for a meeting in New York City to show the progress of their repertoire. The writers who had not produced any material toured the city and were confronted in a hotel room by Jean Ar- uh, Aberbach, who locked them in their hotel room by blocking the hotel room door with a sofa until they wrote the material. Uh, Presley recorded the soundtrack at Radio Records in Hollywood on o- April 30th and May 3rd, with an additional se- session in- at MGM in May. Uh, during post-production, these songs were dubbed into the film, the film scenes in which Presley mimed the lyrics. Jailhouse Rock was Presley's third movie and his first for MGM. The film was originally titled The Hard Way, which was changed to Jailhouse Kid before MGM finally settled on Jailhouse Rock. The film was not listed with the studio's planned release for that year, which it published in Variety Magazine, because it was based on an original story by Nedrick Young, a blacklisted writer. The dance sequence to the film's title song, Jailhouse Rock, is often cited as Presley's greatest moment on screen. It was also the first scene that they filmed. Uh, In his book, Spectacular Passion, Cinema, Fantasy, uh, Gay gay Male Specterships, uh, Brett Farmer places the, quote, orgasmic gyrations of the dance sequence with a lineage of cinematic musical numbers that offer a, quote, spectacular eroticization, if not homoeroticization, of the male image. Uh, Alex Romero, who created moves inspired by Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, choreographed the sequence. Presley was not convinced by Romero's initial choreography, so Romero played some music and asked Presley to dance using his own moves to choreograph the final sequence. Impressed with the dance sequence, Kelly himself applauded one of the rehearsals during a visit to the set. Presley's characteristic hairstyle and sideburns were covered with a wig and makeup for the scenes and musical number uh, and those set in the jail. During the performance, one of Presley's dental caps fell off and became lodged in his lung. He was taken to the hospital where he spent the night after the cap was removed. Shooting was resumed the next day. Jailhouse Rock was Judy Tyler's last film. Two weeks after shooting the film was complete, she died in an automobile accident that also killed her husband. Presley, moved by the death of his co-star, did not attend the film's premiere. The New York Times criticized Guy Trosper for writing a screenplay where the secondary characters who might Mickey Shaughnessy and Judy Tyler acted out were, quote, forced to hang on to the hero's flying mane and ego for the entire picture. The PTA... Parent Teacher Association described the movie as, quote, a hackneyed blown up tale with cheap human values. Wait, the PTA or like a PTA PTA reviewing movies? Crossville's (laughs) elementary school. No, the PTA of of America came out against this movie. (laughs) Um, And the only positive review I could kind of dig up was from the Gadsden Times that said Elvis Presley not only proves himself as a dramatic actor, but also reveals his versatility by dancing on the screen for the first time the movie also contains elvis's unique style of singing um on that note 
let's talk a little bit about Jailhouse Rock. Um, this made it into the series because, of course, Elvis is is very iconic in the state of Tennessee. Um, so I guess what what did you make of him, his character, and kind of his this his persona in this movie compared to I don't know other 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 big you know, music stars that you've seen jump in the movies. I mean, we've talked, we talked about uh, Dean Martin in our Jerry Lewis series, but you know, you have Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, you know, you can go on and on, but Elvis, I feel like, you know, as him in a mo- him in a movie, what, what did you make of that in jailhouse rock? <laughs> I was interesting. You mentioned Dean Martin. I was getting some buddy love vibes from uh, parts of jailhouse rock, though. I think it's a little bit more aware of its own, um, assholishness, uh, it, or at least comments upon it a little bit more. Um, I think both of the movies that we're going to talk about today are not super ambitious aesthetically. Um, and so they live or die for you based on how compelling you find their narratives or how charismatic you find the icon in the center of them. And in the case of Jailhouse Rock, I think that it has um, a lot of the latter, but not so much of the former. I do think that Elvis brings uh, a nice gravitas to this role. Um, I think that his dancing is pretty incredible. Uh, and it, it totally clicked for me, Zach, when you were reading the info sheet and you said that some of these sequences were choreographed by the guys who choreographed for Gene Kelly. Because I was thinking about Gene Kelly a little bit watching, especially the actual Jailhouse Rock dance sequence, as well as the poolside performance that he gives later, even though that's a little bit more subdued. Uh, you definitely sense a, a extreme control that Elvis has over his body that he's always thinking about while he's singing, uh, which makes sense why he decides early on in this movie to not perform with the guitar, even though, you know, in his career, he, he played a guitar while he was uh, performing uh, many times. But it, it kind of gets in the way of the, the visual uh, spectacle that he, he kind of puts... Um, puts before you in Jailhouse Rock. I also like the way that Elvis's face looks on camera a lot, uh, which is probably not a very controversial thing to say. Like he's very, uh, it, it almost like glows off the screen. He has a very pale white face and it's a very soft face as well. It kind of sticks out from all of the harsh surroundings, uh, even when he's like, uh, you know, breaking rocks in prison in the first act of this movie. Like his face always just pulls you into the, to the film. Uh, we can kind of talk more about the narrative later, but that's kind of my initial impressions of Elvis in it. Um, I was, I haven't actually seen any other Elvis movies. I'm, and I'm not a big Elvis music person, but I was thinking about like when musicians or pop icons like decide to be in a film role, like how they want that to fit into their already perceived persona. And I feel like Jailhouse Rock is weird because like isn't Elvis like a, a sweetheart or something and, and the the character he plays here is just, just sucks just sucks the whole time and he, and, and, and he doesn't get better <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was kind of looking it up and this is his third film that he's done and it seems like he's playing against type and that's just really funny to me like <laughs> uh I don't know, the idea of rock and roll seems kind of tame now, but I guess in Elvis's time, like, that that was scandalous, and he was, re- like, <laughs> right? Outlaw music. Like, he, he's a rebel, and, like, <laughs> like, a shitty teenage kid is cool, I guess. Yeah, kind of a James Dean-style yeah. persona in this movie. But yeah, um, James Dean is a, good, is a good marker. That's kind of what I was thinking of, especially for the first... 10 or so minutes when it's introducing the whole plot line that gets him into jail he kind of had this James Dean rebel without a cause vibe to him right without it's a fight sadness. that goes too far yeah he d- he doesn't have necessarily much maliciousness in that sequence that puts him in jail the movie frames him as a victim in a lot of ways um, but he is a jerk uh, like you were saying Lydia and I think it's interesting that he is playing against his persona type here because the movie 
uh, in a roundabout way, it seems to be uh, like a revisionist biopic of Elvis. Uh, you know, it it starts with it starts with him uh, having his music stolen uh, by somebody else. When it, historically we know that he was stealing the music of other people and not giving them credit for it, um, and it takes him on this trajectory to superstardom that ends with him in Hollywood, which of course is where he is when he's filming the movie. Um, so it's like a it's like a weird straight out of Compton style uh, <laughs> narrative for Elvis to go on, and I there's definitely a lot of choices being made in it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it, I I did get these weird vibes whenever they're in Hollywood and making the movie because yeah it's like okay so we're watching Elvis make a movie in a movie that Elvis <laughs> is making. <laughs> it and was it's like also. This, you're hearing conversation on the side with the crew, like talking about what to uh, like dollying in the shots and things like that. And the 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 movie itself is again, like I said, not particularly ambitious aesthetically. So it's interesting that they would include some shop talk of like what what it sounds like on a movie set where people are making artistic decisions visually, uh, when the movie does doesn't do a whole lot of that. Yeah, um, I, while while the movie doesn't do a whole lot of that as a whole, I will say though that the the Jailhouse Rock the, the the set piece is is really mm-hmm. impressive like that's a really yeah that's a that's a really interesting it kind of evoked um it reminded me a lot of the uh hail caesar channing tatum scene uh yeah. just, <laughs> where, yeah. you, you do get this kind of the, this a little bit of you know a little homoeroticism going on between elvis and all bit. these all these jailmates he's pole uh, dancing yeah so <laughs> It's it, it, like like it, like that was kind of entertaining in that sense. I don't know if they were you know as uh, as wink 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 in on the in on the whole bit as Channing Tatum in, in that whole scene was in that in Hail Caesar, but it was like it, like the, just the the spectacle of it was was very impressive. It also kind of evoked the image of uh, Gold Diggers of 1933, which we talked about yeah, way it was a far. Yeah, old school Hollywood. Yeah, of just well, it just kind of one the 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 pains of the uh, the jail cells. They kind of reminded you of the windows and that one in the one sequence that they have. Um, but yeah, it did have this this you know golden age of Hollywood uh, feeling to it. And the movie lets these musical performances play out in full, a lot of times with barely broken up shots, um, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily see in a biopic like a Walk the Line or a Straight Outta Compton. Like you would get the snippets of the songs that you like to kind of remind the audience, like you know, you like you like this music, don't you? Uh, instead, this feels a little bit more like a traditional Hollywood musical, like you were saying. It, it is weird that it. Uh, kind of crosses that line between being a musical and being a biopic. Another way that the movie is kind of co-opting Elvis's persona, of course, it has to deal with his accent. And so it uh, gives many references to him being, quote unquote, backwoods. Um, and you hear uh, many buttoned up Hollywood elite type people um, refer to his kind of music as hillbilly music, which I'm not quite sure if would have been a pejorative at the time. Um, but it definitely seems like Elvis's, the character who is Elvis's friend, whose name is Hunk, uh, takes offense to his music kind of being looked down upon by these people who are more interested in the exciting, rebellious, and notably profitable uh, rock and roll. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, the movie has an interesting relationship with Elvis's own heritage in the South, and I think that's that's what we'll talk about a little bit with Dolly in 9 to 5 as well. Um, it's re- reference, it's alluded to, but the relationship is kind of blurry, um, and it doesn't seem all too interested in Elvis as a Southern icon, it just Elvis as a pop icon. Yeah, it, it, I don't think his his southernness really really uh, bleeds through. I want to just mention that I love Hunk because he yeah. call, <laughs> whenever he calls people over, he goes, "Hey, come here, you birds!" And it was amazing. <laughs> like, it was just like every old movie cliche of all time. Um, I also was really impressed by Hunk's musical performance at the beginning of this film. Um, it's it's another one of those sh- those um, sequences that doesn't have a lot of cuts in it, and you just sit and watch this guy play an acoustic guitar and sing for about two and a half minutes. And um, I don't know, maybe I just have a, like a nostalgic bias for this kind of music, but I I found it um, really touching. Yeah, 
though it no his his performance was was really great and and I I kind of wish we could have you know focused more attention on this kind of new school versus old school you know between an Elvis's character and the hunk character because I think that that it, that plays a little bit but then it kind of gets sidelined for other more meaningless plot lines that I don't think we uh, but I kind of I kind of wanted to focus in on you know Elv- they, they signed this pact and they were gonna you know go together and, and be stars together and then Elvis gets out early and you know becomes a star very quickly and then when hunk gets out he's already kind of risen to the level that they assumed that they were going to both work on and it's kind of a storyline that just seems to be dropped and i thought that they were going to focus more on because i think that that's something that's so um you know attached to elvis he was this he was this this you know musical act that really uh you know just blew through what many were perceiving was popular or you know whatever right music is supposed to be and I felt like that could have been something that could have been engaged with when you have this kind of old school musician against this the new school pop act um and it, it, I don't know it, it never felt like they like they really could flush that that point out Elvis's relationship to his own music is really interesting in this movie too because at, at no point do I ever get the feeling that Elvis likes music uh, that he cares about music. There's a part where he's recording his first studio track, um, and the female lead says to him, "You know, sing it the way it makes you feel." And I'm like, "Does he? Does he have feelings for this music?" Because uh, it, it <laughs> always seems as though it's a financial decision to make music. Like music is to Elvis as marriage is to Jane Austen characters. Um, in, in a lot of cases, um, he abandons Hunk as soon as he gets out of jail and finds out that Hunk's music is not going to be profitable. Um, And he, at the end of the film, people kind of call him out for for how much he is focusing on money and not focusing on the collateral damage of people around him and the way that, you know, his music is suffering because of this. And... (laughs) The movie once again puts Elvis in a victim position where he gets in a fight that somehow makes him lose his voice. I don't know how that works. Um, and all the all of the other people in the movie have to like come to his bedside and like grovel over him and cry. And then the movie ends in this very sweet note. And I don't know if Elvis has necessarily learned anything um, about music versus friends or music versus love or music versus money. Um, it The movie just ends. <laughs> it's really, really weird. All right. Um, let's move on to 9 to 5 and talk about uh, really the, you know, person next to Jesus in the, in the hearts of the, the of, of our of our kin in, in Tennessee and that's Dolly Parton uh, 9 to 5 it came out in 1980 it's directed by Colin Higgins from a script by Higgins and Patricia Resnick the film starred Lily Tomlin Jane Fonda Dolly Parton Dabney Coleman and Sterling Hayden uh, the film follows three working women who live out their fantasies of getting even with and their overthrow of the company's autocratic quote sexist egotistical lying hypocritical bigot boss uh, the film was based on an idea by Jane Fonda, who had recently formed her own production company. Fonda, uh, quote, My ideas for films always come from things that I hear and I and perceive in my daily life. A very old friend of mine had started an organization in Boston called 9 to 5, which was an association of women office workers. I heard them talking about their work, and they had some great, great stories. And I've always been attracted to those 1940s films with three film, female stars. Fonda says the film was at first going to be a drama, but, quote, any way we did it, it seemed too preachy, too much of a feminist line. I'd wanted to work with Lily for some time, and it suddenly occurred to her, to her producing partner, Bruce, and me that we should make it a comedy. In a 2015 interview with Rolling Stone, Patricia Resnick said that, I, and I like this just as a cinematary note, uh, she showed that uh, Patricia Resnick showed Fonda the Charlie Chaplin film Monsieur Verdu to qualm her fears of the movie being too dark but also comedic. Uh, Colin Higgins came on board to direct and rewrite the script. Part of his job was to make room for all three actresses in the script. Higgins says Jane Fonda was a very encouraging producer who allowed him to push back production while the script was being rewritten. He did admit 
quote, he expected some tension from working with three stars, quote, but they were totally professional, great fun, and they joy to work with. I just wish everything would be, I would just wish everything would be as easy. Uh, Fonda also said, quote, it remains a labor film and I hope of a new kind different from the grapes of wrath or the salt of the earth. Uh, We took out a lot of stuff that was filmed, even stuff the director Colin Higgins thought worked, but which I asked to have taken out. I'm just super sensitive to anything that smacks of the soapbox or lecturing the audience. Fonda says she did a deal of research focusing on women who had begun work late in life due to divorce or being widowed. Quote, what I found was that secretaries know the work they do is important is skilled but they also know that they're not treated with respect they call themselves office wives they have to put gas in the boss's car get his coffee buy the presents for his wife and mistress so when we came to the film we said to colin okay what you have to do is write a screenplay which shows you can run an office without a boss but you can't run an office without the secretaries the movie's theme song nine to five written and recorded by dolly parton became one of the biggest hits of the decade while filming the movie parton found she could use her long acrylic fingernails to simulate the sound of a typewriter she wrote the song on set by clicking her nails together and informing the beat literally weeks ago there was chatter of a sequel that brought back uh which is going to bring back the original cast with a whole new trio of women dealing with workplace harassment uh dolly parton in an interview talking about uh why they would want to bring the sequel back and and how it kind of fits into this era that is you know of me too and time's up she said we weren't going to settle that back then i think that it is always going to be a part of our society but at least now it has been brought to the front and i think that everyone that has ever been abused in any way should come forward and should be listened to and should be heard uh in 1980 roger ebert said about the film nine to five is a good-hearted simple-minded comedy that will win a place in film history i I suspect primarily because it contains the movie debut of dolly parton she is on the basis of this one film a natural born movie star a performer who holds our attention so easily that it's hard to believe it's her first film all right so nine to five um so similar to what we just did with Jailhouse Rock. Uh, what is your perception of of Dolly Parton? Because, yeah, this is her, compared to Elvis, this is her first film. And she had, you know, of course developed a very, you know, stellar musical career up to this point. But I guess, you know, what, how does she, how does she kind of, you know, create this character that I feel like is it, you know, somewhat related to her music persona, but also I think she has to, you know, develop something for the screen as well. Hmm. I think it it is, um, I think this is obviously, or maybe I should say, unfortunately, a political movie, Um, especially watching it in 2018. I think that this uh, question of like, just this, the subject matter of nine to five has become this hotly debated topic. And I think it's very interesting that Dolly Parton is this person who is beloved, like you said, second to Jesus by pretty much everybody in the South. Um, And the South is um, dominantly conservative. um, And yet, Dolly Parton is coming out with this movie in the 80s, like early, pretty early on in her career, um, that makes, like, does no posturing to conservative values whatsoever. Um, And I, I kind of can't believe that her reputation has not suffered among Southern music fans for that at all. Um, And, you know, watching this movie now, in today's political climate, um, I'm kind of reassessing a lot of my um, my preferences in terms of like how I want movies to deal with politics and like whether or not I want movies to disagree with me or whether or not I want them to be uh, helpful in terms of moving the discourse along. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if I've quite settled on where this movie lands for me in that regard, but Dolly Parton is doing a very bold thing in terms of like how she's dealing with sociopolitical stuff in this movie. Uh, But also like on a more fundamental level, she's really funny. Uh, Her acting works 100% of the time in nine to five. I think the scene where she, she calls out the boss and is like kind of poking him around his room is like really convincing acting. Um, And I also love her hair. It is like impossible hair uh, that is, not blonde, but like white. <laughs> um, and 
yeah, it, it, like she's just a, a pretty electrifying performer um, consistently throughout this. And I also think there's a there's a version of nine to five in the multiverse in which she is one of the movie's villains. And I think this this movie is very. Um, uh, you know, warm-hearted and generous in the way that it at no point um, suggests that you should look at her in that way. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. I, I the, the 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 immediate takeaway I had with this movie was just like I I just couldn't believe that this movie came out in 1980. Like I could I, I wouldn't believe that this movie would would come out in 2018, much less 1980. Um. It's just so, you know, it does not hold any punches, and it's, and I, I, I think it, it's not, it is not very, um, it's not trying to do too much in terms of cinematic language. It's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's not trying to be incredibly audacious, but at the same time, it is, it is this very brave uh brave comedy and brave movie because i mean there's a a long sequence in the middle of it where you have the three characters played by lily tomlin jane fonda dolly parton playing out their fantasies of what they would do to like get back (laughs) at the boss that's a very ambitious cinematic sequence (laughs) it is it's very ambitious because because it it completely pauses whatever's happening in the present day narrative and takes you on this just yeah i mean you have the jane fonda one where he's running around the office and it's almost like this uh escape from from you know new york john carpenter vibe (laughs) then you have the dolly parton one where she's reversed the roles and she's you know uh you know objectifying him and and you know lassoing him then you have Lily Tomlin acting out a Disney movie, <laughs> like it's, and that just happens half. Yeah, it just happens so just you know halfway through this movie. It's it, it's absurd. A long like, I, sequence and I, too. It's like fifteen minutes. It is. <laughs> It is, and, but I loved I it love because it. I was like, the "What film. the hell?" I was like, "What the hell is this? This is just random." And I and I feel like, like the the fact that a movie led by three women got away with this, because I think if you had a movie with three men, it wouldn't make much sense. Like it would, it, like it just, it's just such an absurd sequence, and that's the, what I really loved about this movie is that it just, it was so absurd, it, but it it just went with it, and it was, and it was so strong and I, I just loved all three characters I I like I liked Jane Fonda in this movie but I think that she probably ranks third I really liked Dolly Parton and Lily Tomlin a lot more uh, and, and I think that they were just given a little bit more to do possibly Jane Fonda but, is your conduit into the world of the movie and then once you're there it's Lily Tomlin and Dolly Parton's show yeah uh, and so I don't I, I I I wholeheartedly love this movie. Um, Lydia, what did you make of it? I thought it was interesting uh, when you were reading your piece where Jane Fonda said she didn't want it to be like preachy or like that feminist, and I was like, uh, <laughs> the film you made, <laughs> like actually, well, I guess it's I guess like, it's it nails not all like, those points. Um, it's it's not like some, you know, Oscar movie where you know people are like you know looking you know holding the desk strongly and going we have to accomplish this or it will never never be the same ever again. You know, it, yeah. it, it wasn't too self serious. It was I also think it, like it was. It, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say it was never it was never too self serious. It was it was always d- dealing with a lot of these very you know uh, a lot of these um, ideals that the, that second wave feminism was 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 you know ch- you know challenging at that point in time. Uh, but it was it, it did it in such a in such a charming light light hearted fashion that it that it never felt so yeah that it was never heavy handed it never felt like it was teaching you something it was kind of letting you absorb it through osmosis uh, and it's also i think one of the differences between this and other movies about for example, workplace harassment. Um, I'm thinking about Hidden Figures, for example, which is a solid movie. It does what it does very well. Um, but a lot of the ways in which that movie handles political issues is it allows one person in, in the film to say a political stance 
and then it allows another character to give them a zinger and then it cuts away to the next scene. It's like uh, p- progressive cinema by way of zingers. And I think this movie is progressive cinema by way of like farcical slapstick in a lot of cases. And I do think that there is more cinema stuff happening in this movie um, just because of other films that I was thinking about while watching it. I mean, I think one of the biggest ones is Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. Um, I was thinking about that sequence where he's having to um, screw in all of those um, those bolts, I guess you could call them, uh, going down the conveyor belt. Uh, and it just like keeps getting faster and faster. I was thinking about that while Jane Fosta, Jane, Jane Fonda was having her ordeal with the copy machine. Um, and the gag with the, the chair in the boss's office that like keeps falling backwards is like a Buster Keaton joke. Um, and, um, there's the president of the company who you only meet Maybe one time. His name is... Or the chairman of the board. His name is Hinkle, <laughs> which is the name of Hitler in Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. So, I, And the fact that they had everybody watch Monsieur Verdu um, it makes and, me think that this, and, this and, is really and, well... This is well-read comedy. <laughs> well, and let me just add that, that the chairman of the board, Hinkle, is played by Sterling Hayden, yeah. who, of course, is Colonel Jack the Ripper from <laughs> Strange Love. Yeah, he is. <laughs> He doesn't deny them. He, he he doesn't, you know, he doesn't he doesn't woo women, Mandrake. He denies them his essence. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the the politics of the movie and how it deals with gender dynamics in the workplace. Because this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier when I was um, I'm waffling on whether or not I think the movie is helpful. Uh, Not whether or not I agree with the movie, whether or not it's helpful. Um, I watched it last year when it played in the Tennessee Theater. um, And, I mean, it was just a hysterical laugh riot. Um, And this this second watch, I'm watching it at home. The comedy is a little lessened because I'm not in a crowd. And I'm really thinking about what this movie says and and how this movie may have impacted the culture of Dolly Parton fans who are watching it. And I... (sighs) There's, there's a lot of, like, progressive cinema out there because Hollywood is definitely liberal-leaning. And I think in the past, I have been guilty of uh, praising movies because I agree with their politics, not necessarily because they are presenting those politics in, like, a cinematic way or a, um, uh, a way that's going to sway the conversation. Like, I think that one of the biggest problems in fiction about... Um, any sort of socio-political issue is like straw man villains. And this is a way, it, this is one element of the shape of water that has actually made that movie um, uh, weaken for me over time. I love Michael Shan's performance in The Shape of Water, but um, he is either A, too monstrous for anybody to identify and say, oh, I kind of resemble that character. Or uh, the other option is he is so monstrous that people who defend people like him are going to be um, angry or offended that this movie is presenting that character in an unrealistic light. And I think that 9 to 5 is possibly guilty of this. Um, def- definitely guilty of this. What am I saying? That that boss character, you know, for as hilarious as what the movie does with him is, um, he, he is so absurd. Um, and it's like every single second of his life, he is actively doing something sexist, which is not necessarily how, like casual workplace sexism works right like it's insidious it's subtle it people feel gaslighted like did what i think just happened actually happen and here it's just like so overt it's so like cartoonishly monstrous that um i'm not sure how helpful it is and how much it is just like liberals jerking off to the idea of like screwing this character's life over and and where and you know sorry i'm rambling for a long time but where i've kind of eventually landed is 
that the heart of the movie is in that fantasy sequence that you were talking about, Zach. Um, the the Disney um, cartoon version of how we deal with monstrous people. Um, I don't know if this movie is necessarily for a super broad audience or a movie that's going to have somebody recognize their own bad behavior and change their lifestyle. But I think it operates as kind of like a really charming, enjoyable fantasy for people who are um, fed up uh, with, you know, this person in their life in a, in a way that I think that Thelma and Louise accomplishes a similar uh, thing. Like, th- I think there's still value in a movie that is like for um, the the victims and like doesn't give a shit whether or not um, anybody else uh, finds I don't know any any sort of like pro- practical political advice in it. Um, does that make any sense? I feel like I was just talking for a very long time. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I was also thinking about while you were talking. Since this is Dolly's first movie, so like Dolly's fans following her <laughs> to this film and then being confronted <laughs> with this uh, fantasy sequence, basically, of not uh, empowerment, I guess. <laughs> I think it's empowerment. <laughs> yeah, okay. I um, mean, empowerment is a tricky like, word to use in general, but I think that this movie is a, an, an example of that. And so maybe you have people following her who are slightly more conservative or coming from country music, and it's just like, uh, none of that. I mean, a little bit of that, but... (laughs) I mean, this is 20 years before the Dixie Chicks become pariahs in the country music world. Um, And, like, even now, you're not seeing a whole lot of... um, country stars or southern icons brave enough to say anything even slightly negative about our political situation i know there was like a um a musical uh gag at the cmt awards last year where they were making fun of like i don't know if it was anthony scaramucci um or if it was actually Donald Trump. But like Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda and Dolly Parton have been very vocal about their opposition to the president. Like at the uh, Emmys this year, uh, they were presenting an award. And um, Fonda says, back in 1980, in 9 to 5, we refused to be controlled by a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. And then Tomlin added, and in 2017, we still refuse to be controlled by a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. Like it's, amazing to me just like how inflammatory of language they're willing to use and like correct language entirely correct language but even saying the word sexist or saying the word bigot i think reads to a lot of people on the right as like oh you're oppressing me like you're putting a label on me and you're you're discriminating against me and making this assumption like all people who look like me are sexist or whatever um I think that argument is bullshit. I think that these words have definitions and you should use them in ways that are accurate. Um, But it's still it's still astounding to me that somebody like Dolly is kind of continually willing to put her stamp on um, a movie that has this like really extreme, like I said, almost straw man message of like, fuck powerful men all the time. (laughs) They're terrible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sorry um pregnant pause zach anything else to add um no i think i i think i think we've covered everything in all with nine to five uh that's yeah. why dolly's I'm, I'm, the I'm best i'm curious to see um i you know hearing hearing you talking to andrew earlier about like being concerned that uh and I, I feel like this. I'm concerned a little bit about a sequel to this movie in the uh, in the era of Me Too because I feel like um, I feel like it's going to be just a. It's almost going to be like a directly, you know, direct into the mic. You know, this is what we're this is what we're saying, and and I think that we've covered over the course of this part that nine to five. You know, even though it's it, it, it's able to kind of transcend being just this, you know stand up to the mic and, and preach your message type of movie and I'm I'm worried that a sequel to it uh, would be would kind of fall into that you know 
chagrin just because just because just because of the of the political climate that we live in now it would it would feel much more of a you know kind of similar to a lot of the feelings i got while watching uh the post yeah. Steven Spielberg That's movie another, last year, where uh, zing, it's just zinger it, progressive movie, right? It's yeah, it's just it's it you 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 just feel the the message that it's trying to to implant on you, and um, I feel like the original Nine to Five doesn't have that. It's it, it's so charming in in just in just fun as a just as in a basic and it's basic tools as a as a movie comedy um and i'm just i'm I'm worried that a sequel would be much more of a of a message movie now here's why i think the idea of a sequel is interesting and i don't necessarily i'm not going to say the sequel is going to be good uh i think that zach you're probably right and that it is probably more likely to be a kind of zinger preaching to the choir sort of movie uh than the original was but the reason why it's interesting is that Nine of Five came out in the 80s, which is 20 years removed from second wave feminism. Like it's it's making this this you know salient point about women in the workplace, um, and and you know uh, kind of Jane Fonda's character is going out and getting like her first job ever because she's been a housewife before she got divorced, and like that's. That is one of the central um, ideas of second wave feminism is like getting women out of the house and into places where they have like control of their own lives. Um, And then you get there and you find out you're not in control of your own life because there's a patriarchal boss, right? Um, So this comes out 20 years after second wave feminism. A remake of 9 to 5 that comes out in, I don't know, 2020 or 2019 would be like a year or two removed from Me Too. Like it would be in the heat of it as opposed to, okay, let's wait for this controversy to die down and then we'll make the safe point about it that everybody already agrees with. Um, So I think it, it has the potential to be maybe more provocative than the first one. Uh, but time will tell. We shall see. Um, well, yeah. Well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter at handle at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary. We post all of the movies that we talked about in this episode. Uh, next week, we will be, uh, be, be joined by another special guest. We're going to be talking about 2007's Death Proof and uh, Caroline Bim, who has written a number of articles about the this Quentin Tarantino movie movie will be joining us um to talk about it it's going to be an interesting one because quentin tarantino of course kind of a uh, really a, a kind of provocative figure before recent news but now is even, an even more provocative uh figure especially about some of the stuff that uh this movie deals with and and kind of what was happening and what's been alleged about this period when he was making movies um so it's going to be an interesting movie to talk to uh, about but Tarantino is is definitely a big face when it comes to Tennessee filmmaking and filmmakers from Tennessee. So I, I'm excited, and I'm I'm excited to have uh, Caroline, who's who's delved into this movie a lot, to come on to talk about it with us. Um, but yeah, until then, please go to cinematary.com. Like I said before, lots of good reviews coming out, lots of good writing. Hey, on Monday. After this episode drops, Zach is going to have a review of Ready Player One. You know you want to read that shit. Go find it. Zach on Spielberg. (laughs) Um, All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. See you next week.